Hi, I'm Andy Biggs, Congressman from Arizona's 5th Congressional District. Thanks for joining me. I have a special guest here today, an old friend of mine I've known for, for some years, Courtney Levinas. She is president and co-founder of Capital Consulting, one of the most respected political consulting advocacy and association management firms in the state of Arizona. Founded in 1999, the firm specializes in advocacy, public affairs, grassroots, and coalition building policy and message development at the federal, state, county, and municipal levels. Capital Consulting also provides association, nonprofit, and event management. And she also serves as the president and CEO of the Arizona Multi-Housing Association. And that's really what we want to talk today about, Courtney. Um, give us the timeline on the governor's use of his, uh, uh, his ostensible executive authority to stop uh, eviction and, uh, in essence, allowing tenants to stay free in a, in a right. uh, residential house. Right. So on March 24th of this year, soon af after the pandemic really hit Arizona, um, Governor Ducey implemented an, an eviction delay or an eviction moratorium here in Arizona. So that was March 24th. Um, and that executive order was put into place for 120 days. And then in late July, the eviction moratorium was extended and th through October 31st. So between the two executive orders, um, rental property owners in, in Arizona are looking at the potential of 221 days, to be exact, <laughs> of, of potentially going with, without receiving any rent. Yeah, so we're talking almost eight months, uh, really, uh, with receiving no rent. And we've talked, to, um, I've interviewed a lot of business owners and I haven't ever uh, in interviewed uh, landlords or landlord representative, but you have the same problems as, as virtually any commercial business does in that you have no cash flow and yet you have obligations um, and, and payments that you have to make uh -huh. So, so tell us about that and how that, uh, what, what obligations that a landlord yeah. would have to pay that they're not going to be able to make. So that, I mean, that's an important point. Um, through the federal, and I'll just give you a little bit of background on the federal moratorium as well, there were requirements to hold off on evictions. Um, the difference being, if you have a mortgage that's backed by the federal government, FHFA, then you receive some mortgage forbearance. Um, so you did receive some assistance. Unlike the program through the governor's eviction delay, there's no mortgage forbearance out there. So rental owners are paying their mortgage. They're paying their uh, property taxes. We can't forget our property taxes. <laughs> they're paying for utilities. They're paying for maintenance and operations and for payroll. So a, a typical, and this is nationwide, a typical um, apartment owner may only profit nine cents on the dollar for every dollar of rent that's received. Um, and that's the whole spectrum of rental housing. So that's your big operators to your small operators. So there are some that, that receive very little or no income. Um, you know, the only income that they receive is when they when they sell the assets sometimes. So to impose an eviction moratorium on rental housing owners and to ask them to go 221 days without income is it's not sustainable. It's not resolving the issue. It's just kicking this can down the road. And we're not doing that. We're not seeing that in any other aspects of, of industries in Arizona. And, and not that I'm saying that it should be, but we're not asking grocery stores to provide free food for 220 days. We're not asking gas stations to provide free gas for 221 days because really there's no industry that could sustain providing services or products for that long without income. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is remarkable um, that um, elected officials, some elected officials think, um, you know what, just you'll be fine and you'll eat it. But, but this really has a cascading effect. I mean, some of the things you were talking about. So if the air conditioner goes out on a rental unit, it isn't the tenant that's going to eat that cost. It's going to be the landlord. And, and by the way, under the Arizona Residential Landlord Tenant Act, uh, if an air conditioner goes out, that's the major problem. And they can't just boot you out somewhere else. They have to take care of that. Right. And 
And so, so you've got that going on at the same time. And you mentioned that you've got basically investors and finance companies and, and uh, mortgagees. You've got a whole series of, of entities that are also not getting the, their payments from the landlords. Mm -hmm. And this thing has a, 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 my point is it has a cascading, cascading. effect throughout the entire economy. Mm -hmm. so, so you guys, um, you got some small mom and pops, you got some bigger folks, I know, but you, 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 you filed a special action um, in the, I assume with the, the you go in Superior Court or Supreme, Supreme Court? Supreme Court. Went to the Supreme Court, okay. So tell us about what, you're, what, what this is about and, and what you're hoping to accomplish here. Really, and that's, and that's really the crux of the issue. Um, you know, two months ago when we met with the governor's team, we, we asked them to reinstate our property rights. And this is what it boils down to. Our property rights have been infringed upon. And, you know, there's, a, there's approximately 920,000 rental contracts throughout the state of Arizona. And those contracts have all been infringed upon. Um, even though in the executive order, there is still a provision that says the resident is responsible for, to pay their rent. The executive order does not relieve them of that obligation. Um, it relieves them of other obligations, though. It relieves them of the obligation to, to pay it timely. And um, it obviously voids the, the rental housing owner's um, remedies for a situation when a resident does not pay their rent. Yeah, I mean, when, when, you, when you start thinking about almost a million people, not, not million people, million households in the state, mm -hmm. a state with just under 7 million people, so you're, you're impacting literally uh, a couple, almost a couple million, maybe a little bit more of, of Arizonans. And right. at the same time, you're, you're taking people, uh, a lot of people, especially in the smaller category of landlord, they might have bought a house or two along the way, thinking that they would get some rental mm -hmm. income to help them pay for their retirement right. or give them some cash flow. Um, and it's gone. It's mm -hmm. gone. So, but, but part, of, part and parcel, go ahead, Courtney. No, I wanted to just point out one thing I think that would, that would surprise people that are, that are watching and listening to this is <laughs> this is happening with, with some of our smaller operators and our, and our big apartment communities. Um, but if your lease is up, say you had a 12 month lease and it ended June 30th, um, and, and maybe you hadn't been paying on it for a couple of months, um, the property can't non-renew that lease under this executive order. So even though the lease is up, that resident is allowed to stay and continue to not pay. And with our small operators, we've heard from individuals who um, their family has been impacted by COVID and they wanted to offer their rental home to their children who are out of work. And um, the lease was up and they couldn't move the residents out. Their children couldn't move in to a home that they own. Um, so there's there's all kinds of issues and concerns that I think a lot of people don't don't understand what's happening with property rights under this executive order. Well, and you've and you've covered it real real well on two fronts: uh, interference with contract uh, contract rights. In other words, um, one of the things that make, makes America so unique is uh, a typically a, a, a a, a reverential respect for contract rights. You have a right to enter a contract. I have a right to enter the contract and we go forward. So basically the gov governor has superseded uh, a million, almost a million contracts uh, that, that are going forward. So, so those, those terms don't apply anymore. And the other thing is, is when you start talking about property rights, when we talk about life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, Americans from the founding to this day have understood that property rights uh, are one of the key aspects and components of being able to pursue uh, your happiness because yeah. it allows you to, ec it gives you economic freedom and economic mm -hmm. mobility and, and hope. And, 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 and so this is really an unbelievable thing. And, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it makes me, makes me kind of upset because I don't know what authority uh, uh, having looked at the executive, uh, uh, authority that's claimed here, it certainly seems to uh, exceed constitutional bounds. And that's why you're taking this to the Supreme Court, because you want them to adjudicate whether whether there's been a violation of constitutional rights here. Right. I mean, I think you're really getting into the, 
the very important and the crux of the issue on the separation of powers issue. Um, I think it's clear that the governor does have some authority when it comes to this pandemic. Um, and he certainly does for areas of public accommodation. But apartments and rental housing homes are not public accommodations. Um, and essentially what's happened is is private property has been turned into public housing overnight. And what comes with public housing is resources, um, but those resources did not come with it. So the, the property owner was just left holding well, now, the bag, so to speak. That, le that leads me to just a, a couple more points. Um, number one, I, I, have, I have viewed um, this authority as as, as a takings, actually, not just in, in this instance, but throughout the economy. I mean, to tell certain businesses, you must close up and you can't have income or anything like that. You, you're taking their, their right to have a business. You're taking uh, something away from them. And typically, and Arizona's constitution is wonderful because the eminent uh -huh. domain statute, the takings uh, clauses are so narrowly drawn that we, in my opinion, you've, we've gone way beyond that, and the govern, government has to respond and provide that, right. that, that response. The problem is some of these takings have gone so widespread in the economy that I don't know how we ever recover the, the losses that we're seeing, whether they be in the multi-housing uh, uh, folks or, or anywhere else. So. Just, an, just a, a tragic thing. In, in it is tragic. And we're not seeking, I mean, we're not seeking to to um, get damages in this case. I mean, we recognize that this is a pandemic and everyone's doing the, the best that we can. We would like to see the state deploy resources um, a lot more efficiently than they have. Um, but while we understand there have been, you know, there have been obvious damages with this um at this at this point, and I don't think in the future we would we would be seeking damages. But I think that that is certainly it is certainly a case that could be made. Um, we're choosing not to do that. Yeah, I, I I think you just want to get some modest restoration of your of, of the property rights that right. that that you've leaned on all these years, uh -huh. and, and we all have leaned on all these years. Right. So that's that's important. So, has this lawsuit been filed? It has been filed. We filed it yesterday with the Arizona Supreme Court. Do we have a briefing schedule yet? We don't. We anticipate we'll um, find out about that hopefully in the next few days. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to be watching this, Courtney. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, I wish I, we I, weren't here. I wish we didn't have to watch it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. But I, I'll just tell you there, I, I get it. You've got, you've got tenants that are in a bind because uh -huh. their jobs – their businesses yeah. have been closed down. And so this, this is the ripple, this is the cascade mm -hmm. that goes through it. But, yeah. but there are ways to open up our economy more fully. And, and, and basically if that were to happen and you guys had your rights restored, I think, I think we would see far less stress for both tenants and landlords and property owners and business owners and this, than the greater public. So. Yeah. I agree. Well, thanks so I much. Agree. Thanks, Courtney. It's good talking. Great to good see you. Yeah, and uh, keep us posted. We'll, we'll keep watching it very Will closely. Do. All right. Thanks. Right. Take care. You too.